Welcome to Capital Decanted. In this show, we say goodbye to tired market takes and superficial sound bites. Because here, instead of skimming the surface, we dive into the heart of capital allocation, striking the perfect balance and exposing the subtleties that reveal the topic's true essence. Prepare to have your perspectives challenged as we open up the issues that resonate with the hearts and minds of those shaping capital allocation. We've enlisted the wisdom of visionary leaders in the industry, and just like a meticulously crafted wine, will allow their insights to breathe, unfurling their hidden depths and transforming our understanding. This is season one, episode two of Capital Decanted. I'm John Bowman. And I'm Christy Hamilton. And we are your hosts. A huge thank you, first of all, to our season one title sponsor, Franklin Templeton Alternatives. With over 40 years of alt investing and $260 billion of asset center management, they've assembled and offer specialist investment managers across six different asset classes, private debt, hedge funds, real estate infrastructure, private equity, and venture capital. And of course, all of them operate with the client-first mentality that has always defined Franklin Templeton, prioritize investment outcomes. So thanks so much to Franklin Templeton Alternatives. Christy, this one was a beast. It was like wrestling a Leviathan, this democratization. How did your weekend go? How did your prep go for this? It's been a lot of fun. I now know more about the Investment Act of 1940 than I ever thought possible. And I have a new appreciation for just how big global investable markets are. Exactly. And I had a lot of feelings about it, surprisingly. I don't know about you, but a lot of strong opinions that I had to really think through. So we can get into those later though. Well, feelings are good. That's why we're doing this, right? Is to let all of them get on the table and exercise a little bit priority, examine them. This one was one of those complex onions which you could never reach the core because you kept peeling something back and then something else would appear. It's so big. We could have gone down a path and several of these could have been their own episodes. So regulatory evolution, we'll spend a little bit of time on. We could have done a lot more on this. Product design. There's been huge amounts of evolution there. The whole alts performance debate, should retail investors even be getting access to this? Is it worth it? The retirement gap crisis, investor protection. There's just multitudes of facets of this diamond. You could keep spinning it and keep going forever. But we had to take some priority, some executive decision-making, and hopefully what you're about to hear is a good overview of the monster that this is. Well, let's tackle it. So. Let's jump in. Democratization. So it's a word loaded with independence, equal access, maybe most of all, Americana, maybe Texas, Texas in particular. It's a word that conjures up this binary and heated debate about fairness and liberty of choice. But is democratization always good? Is unfettered, equal, easy access for everything, for everyone, inevitably the best solution? As a society, we certainly work to protect the eyes and ears of children, both as parents, at least the responsible ones, in family choices and technology features. So think of content or parental controls. And government agencies do the same with warning labels, language constraints, adult content restrictions. Countries have minimum drinking ages. We've got driver's tests, eligibility requirements for military service. Sometimes we deem the collective social risk outweighs someone's rights to access a product or service or activity at least for some period of time. Or sometimes it's the case that we believe mature heads just need to prevail and protect people well from themselves. So how do we weigh all of these complex moral and societal dilemmas as it relates to retirement security and specifically around what types of asset classes should be available or investable to the general public in different retirement vehicles and pools? The big question is really this, is it the government's role to protect and therefore restrict individual citizens from what they deem risky assets? And if so, what criteria should be used to determine when that restriction should be lifted? Or should we simply demand standards of transparency and reporting and trust adults with their own money? Let the chips fall where they are. So that is the big task for us to tackle today. And Christy and I are like utility infielders. We're still trying to figure this whole podcast thing out. We shift around the field and play whatever position we need to. So today we're flipping the script a little bit. In the first episode, if you listened, Christy handled background. I took setup. We're going to reverse and shift positions this time. So for this episode, I'm going to take background. And to do that, I'm going to describe three intersecting themes in history that define this discussion. First is going to be 
a long, windy, and glacial path, forgive me, believe me, I have short-circuited as much of this as possible, but it is long. It's 90 years worth, quite explicitly, of the regulatory environment that has been such a central pillar of this debate. And of course, some of the governors are impediments that allow or restrict from this happening, at least legally. And second, I'm going to briefly summarize public versus private market structure. This is such an important part of this discussion in any debate about diversified portfolio discussions, this issue of portfolio construction. When we think about fairness and access, it is highly misunderstood, this part of the discussion. And thirdly, finally, I'm going to touch on some of the product proliferation that's occurred, particularly in the last decade, how these new structures have fared and perhaps what they teach us or perhaps what they should warn us about in further evolution. And then I'm going to hand to Christy for the setup segment. She's going to walk us through some of the sizing, the stratification of where we stand today in wealth management exposure, why there's a bit of FOMO and voracious appetite right now, given the economic and market environment, and some of the challenges, dangers that we should just be aware of that should give us pause in this trend. And then, of course, the highlight of the show, we welcome our guests for this episode, Allow the topic, as we say, to breathe a bit more. So joining us today are Joan Solitar, Global Head of Wealth Solutions for Blackstone, and Fran Kinnery, Head of Vanguard Investment Advisory Research Center. Previously, you may know, he stood up Vanguard's private equity capability just a few short years ago. So there it is. That is the agenda for the day. And let's get started. So I've got a couple big prefaces before I dive into background. And I want to use our metaphor for the show, decanting a wine, to kind of make this first point. When you decant a wine, there's two main purposes. The first one, as we often say, is to tame the tannins. When you oxygenate the exposure of all these different parts of the wine, it helps smooth the taste. It makes it much more drinkable. And second, particularly for older red vintages, you want to separate the sediment. So you don't want to be chewing on your wine, right? So in particular, that second one, just just like in a corked bottle before you decant it, we need to separate the sediment of two conversations that often are one, are combined, are difficult to unpack, right? And so we want to do just the same thing with our discussion here. And those two conversations that often occur in parallel is one, the merit of private capital and alternatives. Kaya itself was born out of 22 years ago, the philosophy that all long-term portfolios, whether perpetual like a sovereign wealth fund or an endowment, or temporal like a pension or retirement nest egg, they should invest across the full spectrum of asset classes and risk premia. And that's, of course, with the idea to ensure the optimal risk return profile and it allows for less correlated cash flows and the behavior of the underlying assets across the cycles. You're setting yourself up for an all-weather portfolio, the more risk premia you have access to. So that's the first argument that often I think is present when we debate this issue. The second one's the more hairy one though. And even Christy and I found as we did our preparation and our discussion around this, that even we were getting wrapped around the axle a little bit on separating these two. And that is how do we wrap or structure those assets in a way that suits individual investors, given their sensitivity to fees, their need for a little bit more liquidity. And, and we'll t- as we'll talk about today, psychologically, their conditioning to want liquidity, tax implications, performance, concern over leverage, concern over who their co-investors are and the personality of those that are riding along with them. These are all much more acute issues in a retail environment. And as I said, it's often the case in our industry that we tend to conflate. We marry, we confuse these two debates into one, which leads to frustration because we are often arguing about two different things, talking around each other, sometimes not even knowing it. So just as decanting those fine wines tames the tannins and separates the sediment, here at Capital Decanted, it's our intent to tame the rancor and isolate and disaggregate the issues. So there we go. I see, I hear and see and imagine eye rolling throughout the listening public. I laugh. Well, thank you, Christy. I'm a big fan of metaphors, so there you go. We've got one that likes my jokes. So that's my first preface. Let's be intellectually honest and thoughtful about the debate we're actually having. My second preface, for someone that spent my career traveling extensively to Europe and Asia, I am really sensitive about this, about the myopic 
tendency of Americans. I love our country, but let's just be honest, we're pretty typically naive on how the world operates outside of our borders. So it's always our goal here at Capital to Canada to take a global view, a global view of these topics. However, today we're going to depart from that. And as we dove into this prep, I just think it became unavoidable. I mentioned this at the beginning of the episode. This was just a beast. And unless you wanted a five or six hour episode, we had to prioritize. And so why did we choose to do this? Well, the regulatory debate in the US and the discussion around access to alts and the product development that is enabling it, that's ensuing, has been largely led here in the States. And so many are watching this dialogue and debate play out. So the US is a bit of a petri dish for how many of the other financial centers around the world may experiment, may respond, may follow, may diverge. So it's a bit out of character for us. Uh, I'm going to be spending a lot of time on US market and regulatory history. So this is just a big fat, forgive me, this is not my normal approach, but I do hope it becomes clear why as we get into this. So Christy, I'm going to head into background. Anything to add before we jump in? I will just add that I will wrap it up quickly. At the end, I mean, because I'm actually really interested to hear all about the regulatory side. I think that's a part that people tend to gloss over. And I think it's really important, though. If you've been listening to us riff, even teasing out that we're going to be talking a lot about regulatory history, I have to imagine your eyes are glazing over. Hopefully you haven't hit the stop button yet. But let's just say this is really important. As I dug into this, it's really important to understand the debate at the SEC and Congress and the pace and path of the product trajectory from the perspective of 100 years ago. I know that sounds silly, but a lot of the same dialogue is rooted, is moored in the motivation of the original version of this rule a century ago. And that starts in the Great Depression. It followed the Great Depression. And to understand this market crash that I know we all know a little bit about and the economic turmoil and the investor psyche and ultimately that financial regulatory foundation that our entire system is built upon, it is useful to address the decade that preceded it. Decade that preceded the Great Depression, of course, the Roaring Twenties. So Christy, I know that we joke a lot about the 80s being the peak of human civilization, but the more I researched the 20s, this was pretty darn close. Things were pretty happening back then. On the investment front? Well, certainly on the investment front, as we'll see in a moment, but let's just say that things were a popping and a hopping through the 20s. So the roaring 20s, it was sheer madness is maybe the best way to say it. The echoes of the last 15 years in the 20s is palpable. We often hear, right, history rhymes right? It is rhyming hard here. The economy, capital formation, and the markets were just smoking. Euphoria had set in, not just among wealthier individuals, but the middle class as well. And what happens, we've seen this movie before, what happens when overconfidence and overcapitalization happen in the markets? Well, people begin to become more speculative, rash in their investments. And guess who was a familiar actor and accessory to all this bliss? It was the central banks. Again, I told you that history rhymed. After this short-lived post-war recession in 1920, the Fed committed to keeping interest rates artificially low, very cheap cash. And they eased, or liberalized at least, reserve requirements on the banks. So with help from the banks and deposit institutions, credit effectively became free and bottomless for those that didn't have the financial means to borrow. So hopefully you're starting to sense a little bit of recency bias here. Investment companies and swindlers were selling patriotism. They were selling pride in technological innovation. Advertisers jumped on board. They were selling opportunity and euphoria. And they further fed this mania that prosperity would never end, that it was different this time, right? So F. Scott Fitzgerald, one of my favorite quotes about the 20s, obviously famous American author that wrote Great Gatsby, amongst others, he had some personal essays entitled My Lost City. And this was based upon his own experiences through the 20s. And he wrote this, the tempo of the city had changed sharply. The uncertainties were drowned in a steady golden roar. The restlessness approached hysteria. The parties were bigger. The pace was faster. The shows were broader. The buildings were higher. The morals were looser. And the liquor was cheaper. So F. Scott certainly captured that. It feels very Great Gatsby. I mean, there's no doubt that Great Gatsby, if you read that book or watch the rendition with Leo, Like this, F. Scott Fitzgerald's experiences really shaped those scenes. Have you seen Midnight in Paris, by the way, Christy? I have not. 
Okay. Well, Owen Wilson, great actor, very funny actor. So he's this aspiring writer and romanticist who is in Paris about to get married. And he spends his evenings hanging out with F. Scott Fitzgerald, his wife Zelda, Ernest Hemingway, Gertrude Stein. It's an outstanding illustration of the 20s we've just talked about. So check it out. Really fun one. An underrated movie. So this was the environment, the mentality, and the identity of America just before the Great Depression, which, as you probably know, was the longest and deepest global recession of the last century. Between 1929 and 1932, U.S. GDP fell by 36%, 36%. Just let's put that in perspective. GDP was down 1% post the GFC and the ensuing recession in 08, 09. We don't have a playbook for this, Christy, in our minds at all for what that would feel and look like. We had 25% unemployment, one in four, massive deflation, international trade fell by half, by 50%. Really, the global industrial and construction sector effectively went into paralysis. It just shut down. You had mothballed buildings around the world. Even the farmers suffered. So you had farming produce prices fall by over 60%. And most important, maybe as most of the listeners realize for this episode, is that over this same time, the market fell 90%. 90%. It'd be 25 years, a quarter century before the Dow, and I realize the Dow is only 30 stocks, but before the Dow would return to the same level as 1929. So as you might imagine, the whipsaw in the public psyche of markets in the financial system was violent. You know, this is what breeds this type of seesaw is what breeds distrust, fear, paranoia. So when we see the vitriol and all this massive hyperbole and name calling to hedge funds today, private capital fund managers, GPs, let's just say this is not new. Its roots go all the way back to the bitterness of the public following the roaring 20s. And so when Elizabeth Warren stopped Wall Street Looting Act comes out in 2001, or the belittling and defamation with word like vultures, asset strippers, robber barons, right? This lexicon and posture has been conditioned. This is our normal reaction. This is the usual sequence of events. And our PR for private capital and hedge funds is just terrible. And so we just don't seem to set ourselves up or respond very well. And we're going to unpack this a little bit more with Fran and Joan, why we sometimes just can't get out of our way of teaching and promulgating the underlying good of financial markets, despite some of the mistakes that are made, no doubt, along the way through the cycles up and down. So back to the early 30s. We've seen this movie before. There's a run on the banks. Customers are freaking out. They're clamoring to withdraw their money, hide their savings under mattresses. That's where that figure of speech comes from. Inside books, boxes buried in the yard, or anywhere else that they think is safe. Some went so far as to exchange their dollars for gold, ship it out of the country, ship it to a long lost relative in Europe, maybe. So, into this morass of chaos and disenchantment walks President Franklin D. Roosevelt, FDR, and he introduces his massive stimulus and reform agenda called the New Deal. So, the New Deal was a series of programs, public works projects, financial reforms, and regulations passed and implemented between 1933 and 1939. And for purposes of this episode, this is just mind-blowing when you do the research on how big and influential this New Deal agenda was. But out of the New Deal came things we know dearly today, like the Social Security Program, the FDIC, Federal Housing Authority. Many of you, first mortgages might have been through an FHA loan. And most prominently, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, the regulatory agency designed to protect investors and promote values, oversight, and rules to restore the public's trust, restore and maintain, I should add, to create a social warranty, you might say, for the capital market system. And Christy, you alluded to this in the opening. Their first big order of business was none other, and they could use a little marketing help with this, but the 1933 Securities Act. So we often, for purposes of this episode, I told you I was going to try my best to combine and be succinct as much as I may fail at that. I am going to take some liberty here. We often conflate the 33 Act and its close sibling, the 40 Act, but the two massive pieces of regulation and legislation really together largely define the blueprint for how securities are offered to the public, who's eligible to buy them, and appropriate structures of investment companies and how they're to be run and maintained. And this federal structure replaced what was called the old blue sky laws that resided individually with states. And 
they were inconsistent, fairly impotent in their effectiveness. It was either you can offer that security or not. And you could go across border and they might say yes and back to your own state and they might say no. So it was just a bit chaotic and inconsistent. So this was a federal structure to create consistency with the idea of protecting investors. So before offering the security to the public with the 1933 Act introduced was a requirement that all securities are registered with the SEC. And to do that, you needed to provide basic but significant information and transparency around your security offering, things like financial statements, descriptions, a management overview, et cetera. But there were a few exceptions to this registration rule, were a few types of securities, or at least if you wanted to offer certain securities to a certain type of investor that allowed you to be exempt from the registration. And one of which that would confound investors for decades and is still the anchor on which this debate still rages today. The reason we're having this very podcast episode is the exception for private offerings who are only offered to a limited number and specific type of investor that could quote, and this is really important language that would plague the courts for decades, as I'll talk about in a moment. These types of investors could quote, fend for themselves. And they define that by having appropriate sophistication and financial ability to absorb loss. Now, understandably, this exemption for private offerings was trying to thread a critical needle. As we laid out in our opening, there was a huge mandate to protect the general public from highly speculative investments and certainly fraud. They had scars, recent scars from those roaring 20s and at least the conclusion of it that was a feeding frenzy that brought about the depression. But they also realized that onerous rules, overreach, too much administration and fees would stifle innovation and capital formation, particularly for startups and growth companies that were looking to only raise capital within a close, let's say, very wealthy circle. And calibrating those two things has been the greatest challenge for the SEC to this day. This is out of scope, but just a few weeks ago, by the time you listen to this message, there was a massive SEC delivery of new regulation around the private markets industry. And you saw the response to that was a disagreement about whether they got that balance right. LPs largely thought they did. GPs and their trade groups largely thought they didn't. So we have not solved this issue and threading this needle even nearly 100 years later. But back to 33 and this infamous exception, it really didn't define, even though it used some of that descriptive language, it didn't define what constituted an investor who could fend for themselves or really put clarity around the structure and the scope of these private offerings. So for four decades, literally four decades, you had all kinds of ad hoc administrative and judicial interpretation as to how to apply this exception to a public offering. The risk of litigation, as it still is, was rampant, and case law was still in its early days to try to pin down this precedent for what is a private offering and when can you exempt that from registration. In 1978, the SEC, with all of this back and forth case law, decided to promulgate and Congress approved into federal law the concept we now know as accredited investor that put a little bit more guardrails and language around financial sophistication and the number of investors that could participate in private offerings. Yet, a true objective standard of fend for themselves was still elusive. So finally, in 1982, you had the introduction of the income and wealth binary rule that has come to define accredited investor here in the States, even to today. So to be eligible, you must have 200,000 US income or 1 million of net worth. So that's 40 years ago to punctuate this history. You've had nearly zero evolution or modernization since 1982 of this rule. The only exception to that was the Dodd-Frank Act eliminated the ability to include your primary residence in 2011. And there certainly has been whispers of inflation adjustments, inflation pegs along the way just to mark it up based upon today's dollar, but no change to date. And that is still the primary gate today. So that brings us to 2019, just pre-COVID. Feels like two decades ago, but that was just a few years ago under Jay Clayton's SEC leadership. And the SEC put forward some significant proposals after that first material review of the rules since 1982. And most prominently, they confronted was, in my view, a reductionist and incomplete wealth and income test, really stating or asking the question, is this really a solid proxy, just wealth for fending for themselves, to go back to that original legal language? 
Through the last nearly 100 years, the case law confusion and desire for simplicity led the commission to forget that just because you had wealth doesn't mean you're financially sophisticated. So the press release from the SEC quotes Clayton, and he says this, for the first time, individuals will be permitted to participate in our private capital markets, not only based on their income or net worth, but also based on established clear measures of financial sophistication. The amendments allow investors to qualify as accredited investors based upon defined measures of professional knowledge, experience, or certifications. I'll put emphasis, that's my emphasis, in addition to the existing tests for income or net worth. So at the time, I should mention Kaya, we wrote an open letter to the SEC. It was published in Pensions and Investments after that announcement, and we praised the addition of education. It really went back to the beginning and kind of captured the essence and the spirit of that first. 1933 ruling that this was about not only wealth, but also education and awareness. We also, by the way, um, mentioned in that op-ed that a fiduciary advisor or plan sponsor should be in the conversation as well. So that P&I article is noted in the sources on the show notes. So since 2019, sadly, while a few bills have been brought and even passed on the House floor, even this year, They've been mothballed or blocked in the Senate or some combination of both. I liken this to ESG, Christy. The accredited investor modernization sadly has been stained with partisanship. Whoever seems to occupy the White House seems to determine, and their appointees on these regulatory councils seems to determine how these debates ensue. And so to date, in our discussions with both the SEC and FINRA, no third-party certification, even Kaya, who's been the leader in this for 21 years on alternatives, as far as credentials in the space has been approved. So we continue to wait the spirit of that evolution, I would say, going back to where we started is there, but we've not seen much movement since largely because of political gridlock. So there's one more thread I want to pull on in this quick 100 year regulatory history. Remember, I said earlier that the 33 and the 40 Act were close siblings, the 40 Act in particular, and its amendments laid out the type of investment structures that private offerings could take and who was eligible to participate in each of those structures or flavors. And this is really important when we get to our time with Joan and Fran, as Blackstone and Vanguard have taken different paths, as many other firms, at least initially, towards pursuing and structuring products that are targeted towards different segments of the market. So I think it's important that we understand that before we dive in. So to make this very simple, and if there are any securities lawyers out there or GP trade groups, I'm sure you're going to pick apart what I'm going to do, but I'm going to give you kind of the cliff notes on this. There are essentially three categories of funds used to access alternatives for individual investors, let's call it. There are registered funds that are available to the general public with a daily NAV and restrictions on leverage, liquidity, and concentration of clients. There are what's called, a little bit of jargon here, forgive me, 3C1 funds, which are available only to accredited investors. That's what we've been spending all this time talking about. And they are capped. 3C1 funds are capped at 100 accredited investors without the restrictions I described, but often they will have intermittent access to liquidity, either gates quarterly, monthly, semi-annually, et cetera. And then finally, thirdly, we have 3C7 funds, which is the official version of what many listeners will know as traditional private drawdown funds. So these are the seven to 10 year lives, largely targeted historically, at least towards institutional investors like endowments, foundations, and pensions. Now, critically important to be eligible as an individual for 3C7 funds, traditional drawdown, you must be what's called a qualified purchaser, a QP. So many call this a super accredited investor as the wealth rules graduate from the accredited investor of 1 million to 5 million. So a key point here for our debate is that it's illegal. It's not allowed in the US for regulated or 3C1 funds to charge performance fees or carry only the 3C7 funds. Therefore, only institutions and qualified persons can get access to the more aligned fee structure we're all very aware of, the two and 20 world of a management fee plus a carry above a hurdle rate. So these other types, the registered funds, the 3C1 funds, the semi-liquid, you might call the 3C1 funds, are limited to charging just a management fee. That's really important because usually that means it's a big one because they have to make up for the loss of participation in the upside. So that is the regulatory history. So our second big parallel track in history that's highly relevant to this discussion and why the appetite for access to private capital is so rampant 
has been the changing structure and attractiveness of the public markets. The public markets, Christy, are not just what they used to be. And I don't think most market participants understand this. So I want to just examine this for a moment. This is a very brief summary. But from the peak of U.S. listings in 1996 of roughly 8,000 companies, 8,000 public companies, that number is halved today. So there's only about 3,800 public companies in the U.S. So when we talk about the Wilshire 5,000, it's a bit of a misnomer. There's nowhere near 5,000 in that index, much less listed overall. And other than China, if you looked at other developed markets, that trend has largely been the case across the developed world for nearly the last three decades. There's been a departure from public listings, both through either going private and a collapse annually of the pace of IPOs. Now, to make matters worse, the new economy is staying private much longer disproportionately, and in some cases permanently just trusting the private markets because unlike in the 80s and 90s, the heydays of the IPO, the private markets are now big enough, mature enough, complex enough, they can largely satisfy these corporation needs that the corporations previously relied on the public markets to. So Thinking Ahead Institute, this is the thought leadership arm of Willis Towers Watson. They did some really cool work on this. Just to give you a couple case studies, vignettes here. 2004, Google, they raised 25 million, only 25 million in the private markets. Their IPO was valued at 1.9 billion. So that's a 76 to 1 public to private. Okay, so you're raising the large majority, nearly all of your capital in the public markets. 2012, fast forwarding a little bit, Facebook, now Meta, raised 2.4 billion in the private markets and 16 billion at IPO for a much smaller ratio of 6.7 public to private. Still nearly seven times a multiple, but shrinking quickly, right? Now, Go to 19. This is when Jay Clayton wrote uh, his SEC update on the accredited investor around the same time. You could have chosen, by the way, from lots of different examples, but let's take Uber. They raised $22 billion in the private markets compared to only $8 billion at IPO. So that's 0.4 public to private ratio. This entire thing has flipped. These companies are relying and staying private much, much longer. The large majority of the enterprise value and the capital formation is occurring pre the IPO, rinsing much of that value out by the time they offer to the public. So this urgency of private companies moving towards that symbolically important IPO moment, as I mentioned, that the 80s and 90s was really known for, there just is not that case anymore. And that could be a combination of that there's plenty of capital in the private markets, as well as they don't want the headache of quarterly earnings calls, regulatory administration and cost, activist investors, etc. We can have our own hypothesis about that. I'm just giving you the facts. So another way to look at this is that the percentage of large companies in the US that trade publicly. So I think a lot of people look at the S&P 500 or let's just say going the index, right? Pick an index and a passive access to or beta access to the public markets. And they would proxy that for having equity exposure to the global economy or at least to the US economy. But I think that's a flawed assumption based upon this data. So for example, if you take companies with 100 million of revenues or more, less than 20% of them trade on an exchange, less than one in five trade on an exchange. So I'll just challenge what I said a moment ago, the idea that you can get even beta access, equity beta access to the global economy in the public equity markets is just not true anymore. You're touching less than 20% of the total number of companies. Now, for those in the states fortunate enough to be a beneficiary of a public pension plan, so a civic employee, a school teacher, police officer, firefighter, or one of these legacy corporate defined benefit plans, you have had the benefit of much broader diversification opportunities, probably for a few decades, than your neighbor who maybe manages his or her own defined contribution plan or IRA. So this is back to our big moral dilemma. Given this reality of the public markets, is it still politically viable to restrict such a large part of the population? from where all the new economy action seems to be happening, right? Question of the day. And I'm being provocative for fun there. Are you baiting me? I am baiting you. I'm baiting you. Baiting all the listeners. They should be shifting in their chairs ahead of this discussion with our guests. So as the bubble burst a little over 10 years ago and the global financial crisis roiled confidence in the markets, just as it had done in the Great Depression, there was growing interest in individual investors getting access to diversifying strategies or hedge fund-like products through more accessible wrappers. 
And this product proliferation is the third piece and final piece of my history lesson. It's the one last piece of the puzzle in our background segment because it speaks again to lessons learned and the lens by which we should approach carefully this question that's on the table. So huge increase in interest in these complex strategies, but through accessible wrappers that were approved and legal given our regulatory structure. And it was this vintage of product innovation, 2011, 12, 13, when the term liquid alts that we all use was coined. As we described earlier, any regulated fund, both here in the States under the 40 Act regulations and in the European usage structure, they restrict the levels of leverage, concentration, and the liquidity risk in a mutual fund format. And this is why liquid alts 1.0, which is what I call it, in my view, was such a failure because... Christy, guess what happens when you take a complex, highly levered, idiosyncratic strategy and you stuff it into an accessible regulated wrapper for the masses? How's that going to work out? You have an asset liability mismatch. You not only have that, but I think you have an impotent structure that's been stripped of most everything that made it attractive. That gives it a benefit, with the biggest usually being the asset liability mismatch, or the one that people get most publicly angry about. That's right. So if liability streams are a key part of your goals, you're right, this is a mismatch. It turns out that they were less levered than their true hedge funds, the 3C7 traditional hedge funds. They were less volatile, they offer more drawdown protection, and they underperform significantly. So you can weigh that out how you want it. It perhaps lets you sleep better at night, but it underperformed. As I just said, when you strip it of all of its underlying flexibility and how it invests, you kind of neuter the alpha completely, and that should be expected. In fact, a couple of years ago, to put some numbers around this, we, Kai Association, ran a joint study with our friends over at AMA on this subject. And we compared traditional hedge fund performance of various styles, equity hedge, event-driven, macro, relative value against their 40 Act and USIT counterparts. And the performance time horizon for this, by the way, was 2008 to 2020. And across all strategies, all of those strategies I just named, Annualized returns of private hedge funds, traditional hedge funds, produced an annualized after-fee performance of 7.3%. USIT's equivalence on the liquid alt side was 6.6%, and the 40X came in a distant third with the bronze at 6.3%. And in every case, that was the aggregate, in every case across the flavors of strategy, with one exception, private hedge funds outperformed their regulated brethren. Oddly, that one exception is... USIT's equity hedge outperformed actual hedge funds. So interesting. Not sure whether that's nothing but a throwaway, but just a fun fact. Now, I mentioned earlier that with the exception of these three C7 funds, traditional private funds, you can't charge performance fees in the US. You can do that, by the way, in USIT structures, but not here in the States. But in regulated funds or even accredited 3C1 funds, your only lever is that flat management fee. I mentioned this earlier. So they tend to be very high. That's the only tool they've got in their tool belt is the management fee. So Morningstar Direct data estimates that alternative mutual fund management fees in the U.S. average 1.62% for active funds and 1.46% for passive funds. Now, that's compared to traditional hedge fund fees of the 1.15 plus the 14 and change carry. So these are high fee products that just don't produce outsized returns in a regulated form. We are now in the midst of an explosion. The reason I bring all this up is that Liquid Alts 2.0 is here. We're in the midst of this explosion for things like interval tender funds on the private equity and the private debt side. Non-traded REITs, we're going to talk a little bit about BREIT with Joan later, BDCs that are trying to rectify and solve for the sins and the failures of what this Liquid 1.0 experience taught us 10 years ago. So we are going to see how that plays out. So now, if you have not fallen asleep, you are now equipped with 100 years, 100 years, a century worth of regulatory history, of a comparison on how the private markets have blossomed, exploded, and a little bit of a report card on how Liquid Alts 1.0 fared. So I am going to put a pin in our background and history and past before we move to our guests, to Christy, to set us up a little bit more bring this to the present day. I think it's really interesting, particularly taking it back to, or one of the things that I didn't realize is how much the regulatory environment really is stuck in a century ago. 
And in present day, there's just not a lot of change in the mentality. It's almost like that anchored how we think about it. And now we can't think outside of the box of income level. And we are tortured, fit into this thing that isn't necessarily a good indicator of whether or not you can select private investments well, or alternatives well, in my opinion, at least. But now that we have gone through the fun stuff, I kind of want to kick it off, as John said at the beginning, with some present day numbers that are admittedly back of the envelope because for as much as our lives revolve around money, it's actually hard to get a good, accurate representation of the data and the numbers out there. The way Kaya looks at it is basically we have about $153 trillion in total global investable market. Then alternatives are about $22 trillion of that, and that includes private equity, venture, real estate, infrastructure, natural resources, and private debt. And then going back to that $153 trillion number, Breaking that out again by the private wealth side, about 50% of that then is individual wealth. So again, the accredited investor and then down to retail. Was it the Cerulli report, John, that when self-reporting, it looks like that 50%, so those individual investors have about 2 to 8% of their assets in these alternative investments. So 2 to 8 is a very wide range, obviously. And it's hard to back into the 8% number, I'm not going to lie. So based on the data that we have in subsequent parts of that report, it looks like it's about 3%. Would you say that that's fair, John? I think as we've talked about, there's lots of over-reporting on surveys because advisors are anxious to get higher. But I think the more realistic number based on the data is 3 to 5%. How much I wish I was invested in. I mean, I guess that happens on the institutional side as well. But I think that there's always a push for more at this moment. So unlike the institutional side, though, which is pretty well saturated at this point, a lot of people are already approaching their target or there, if not lifting it, but again, getting there pretty quickly. The individual investor side has become one of the fastest growing segments to be interested in investing in this space. But as we know, and as John ran over, that hasn't been without its hiccups. He talked about some of the regulatory stuff that they've had to work through. But then one of the ones that I mentioned, for example, on the asset liability mismatch side, It's just a funny way of saying that the liquidity terms are difficult for a lot of people to deal with. So you end up putting in these alternatives funds, you put illiquid investments that then have a claim of quarterly liquidity against them. I believe this is similar to what happened with BRE, but we also saw this in 2008 as well, where the investor signs the contract saying that they know that the liquidity is not there, that they could be gated, that all of these things could happen. And yet somehow it once again becomes an issue when markets draw down. And those gates get applied. But again, it's this mismatch of you cannot have a pool of illiquid assets with daily liquidity. Certainly, it's difficult to manage even with that quarterly liquidity. It's interesting to me how many people get upset about that, how, quote, it was a bad look to not give investors their capital when requesting it. But at the same time, that was the terms in the documentation. Irrespective of how you feel about whether those are right or wrong, if you sign those terms, you are saying you accept them. And obviously, you don't want to hurt people who are in the funds. They had to liquidate the fund. That hurts everybody. They have to be, again, mindful of that. A second hiccup that has come up periodically is just the due diligence and transparency and the ability to get data. I know on the institutional side, it can be a headache even there. They're pretty open with us, get to read through all the documents, have quarterly meetings, et cetera. But I think that sometimes when you get a thousand pages of documents and legal jargon and stuff that you're not necessarily as used to working with, it can be very difficult. And that's where education comes in, which I think would be my third challenge is how to go about educating people on these assets. And with these educational considerations, it's just a matter of the institutional side has basically been doing this back to the 80s, I would say, after ERISA and when public pensions were able to invest and then endowments were in there as well. 30 years or 40 years of battle scars and learning and passing down information and really having industry best practices, I think it's a little bit more difficult to understand how this would fit into a portfolio or how it would be beneficial, particularly when you work with a client who has something that their friends are telling them or versus what the professional, their advisor is saying. So I think that education will be a huge component of this moving forward, along with what I hope to talk to Joan and Fran about just in terms of communication, like how do you communicate these really complex products to an advisor and then to ultimately to an investor? So there's almost like this weird game of telephone as well that you have to be mindful of where it sometimes breaks down. And it's funny because I think a lot of people know this conceptually, just given I know JP Morgan has a quarterly report that they put out that has these dispersion numbers. But basically, when you're investing in global equity, 
on the public side, pretty tight band between top quartile and bottom quartile and then the media. And it's all very tight. Whereas with private equity and particular venture capital, huge dispersion of returns. On venture, your lowest quartile is going to be negative and your top is basically hitting it out of the park. And so as you look across what is available, being mindful of the fact that manager selection in this is actually an incredibly important component and then access within that manager selection. (laughs) So it'd be great if the top quartile of venture is doing X, but that doesn't necessarily mean that even a lot of institutions can't access that top quartile or that top decile of venture. It's being mindful of the fact that, yes, institutions have these great returns, but that's not necessarily the access that you would be getting. But it could be. Honestly, I think that a lot of people think that individuals are just going to get crappy access. I don't know if that's necessarily true, particularly given that they're smaller and that they have the ability to be nimble. But I guess time will tell, right? I think it belongs in concerns, at least in the way we structure this. It maybe belongs in multiple elements of the discussion, but this really gets at what often people call as the power law, right? Is that if access to first quartile begets more access to first quartile, then it becomes this very tight club that is self-perpetuating. And if you think you have a hard time as a medium-sized LP knocking on that door and getting in fund five when you haven't been in funds one, two, three, and four. Can you imagine what an accredited investor, how possibly could they get access there? Now, this maybe goes back to the structures in which this should be appropriate, meaning some type of a feeder fund or one of the aggregators like Ag Capital that we'll talk about, or the importance of a fiduciary like Vanguard to provide to grease those skids. But it does beg the question as if you were leaving individuals to themselves to try to not only choose managers, which is the maybe intellectual part of it, but then even once they've chosen, the difficulty of knocking down and breaking into that fortress is just really, really hard. And if you can't get in, as we've talked about, as you just laid out, to those top couple quartiles, you frankly shouldn't bother is the math here. So sorry to interrupt, but I do think it belongs in our minds as we think about constraints as one of the biggest concerns in how we square the round peg. That's fair. So I will say sometimes as a medium-sized LP, it's actually easier, right? Because your bite size isn't $500 million that you need to get in there. It can be both a benefit and a drawback. And I think that the last thing that we'll run over is why is this such a big topic right now? I know John mentioned a part of it is because of regulatory changes and updates. Part of it is frankly, because there are quite a few publicly traded GPs now who need the growth or who see it as an area of growth. Like I mentioned before, when you have institutions that are mostly capped out on the investment side, that basically constrains their ability to grow through fees, through funds, through offerings. So I think that is actually not an integral part, but an interesting side point to why now. And then really the biggest thing has just been the demand from individual investors themselves. I think a lot of people have seen how institutions have invested in the performance that they've received and the returns that they have over the past 10 and 20 years. And particularly when it comes to thinking through the retirement gap, which John, I know you alluded to, defined benefit plans get access to this. Why can't investors in defined contribution plans have access to it? That is actually a really important component of this is just the ability to close that gap and to do so thoughtfully. I'll say the other big reason Also, why investors are demanding it is just for diversification purposes. I mean, as John mentioned, again, companies are staying private for longer. And so you have this closed off part, huge part of the market that individuals can't access. And then what they can access has been increasingly correlated. Once again, with low interest rate environment, with these headwinds that have been created through a lot of different factors, investors are really interested in moving beyond a 60-40 portfolio, moving beyond a 60-40 portfolio with just a little tiny bit of alts. I mean, as they look forward, we don't expect public equities to compound at 8 to 10% a year anymore. Where else investing land or in the landscape can you really find offerings that fit the needs of investors? And so I think that constraining people unnecessarily is not the way to go. And so I appreciate that there has been a push for access in client themselves. Yeah, I think that's really well said, Christy. I think Certainly, those tailwinds that have defined the last 40 years, we wrote about this in the Portfolio for the Future, right? Tailwinds of easy access to money. Again, this sounds like the 20s. Easy access to money, 
certainly low tax rates, globalization. There has been just a multitude of very strong conditions that have created the last 40 years. That's not normal. This type of return environment, annual return, is not normal. And so where do you go? How do you get that retirement savings? Where has alpha drifted? So that's a big part of it. A lot of big questions. Again, some of that FOMO that we got to be careful with, right? This is not a surefire way to harvest a liquidity premium. I think that is the wrong narrative as to why to go in. It's about diversification, accessing a big part of the new economy that is inaccessible, as you said, in the public markets. The other thing, just back to your second point on GPs, I think this is critical from a growth perspective. You know, the numbers you walk through, so you take that 75 trillion, which is half the 153, let's say they're at three to 4%, as you suggested, which I think is a good bogey just directionally. That's a round number of about 3 trillion of the 22 trillion that is allocated to alts. As we talk about at, at Kaya and in industry, amongst industry conferences, the journey from 22 trillion to 30 trillion, I think most people would say that's just proportionally going to come from individual investors. You talked about being tapped out on the institutional side. It may not be completely over, but certainly it's going to slow just given where they are in their allocations. Even a, just doing your math, even a 1% increase in allocation, so go from 3 to 4% or 4 to 5%, you're talking about a trillion dollars of investable assets shifting from public to alternatives. That is enormous. So if you're in the GP standpoint, there's no wonder you want to try to take advantage of some of that growth. Honestly, though, that kind of makes me think about it from the LP perspective again. And one of the benefits of investing on the private side is lack of transparency, is the ability to create an informational advantage, is the ability to price lower than what one would expect. And I think as a trillion dollars funnels its way into this side of the investable universe, you could see an increase in transparency. You could see a decrease in that quote unquote illiquidity premium because as the market itself becomes more liquid and has more money washing around, I think that those outsized returns might naturally come down. And that's not a reason not to do it. And I'm not saying that is exactly what would happen. I don't know the future, but it is an interesting thought when you throw such a huge number out there. I agree. There's no doubt, right? More money chasing fewer options is going to squeeze the competitive advantage out. Which is why, as I said a moment ago, I think the e-liquidity premium is often a red herring for the discussion. It gets in the way of the diversification argument that I think is the much more important piece, that whole private market structure that's exploded. That is a question, though, to your point, And as we described in the regulatory segment, these are likely different wrappers. It's unlikely that a wealthy individual, except if you're QP level, is going to be a co-investor with the LPs that you used to work for, Christy, right? And so this means that it's likely a different product. And what does that mean for the quality of talent, the quality of the underlying portfolio companies, of the underlying assets, the deal sourcing? Are we going to get the B team? I think this is a real concern that we want to press Joan and Fran on as well, because these are parallel tracks in most cases. So I think we have exhausted that history. Let's leave it there. Let's continue the discussion in a few moments with Joan and with Fran. But in the meantime, we are going to shift to halftime, spend a few minutes hearing from our sponsor we're very thankful for, Franklin Templeton Investments. Stay with us. Well, as promised, we are here with Dave Donahue. Dave is the co-head of U.S. Wealth Management for Franklin Templeton Alternatives. Dave, welcome to Capital Decanted. Thank you, John. Great to be here. And thanks for you and Kaya for everything you're doing for the alternative industry. Truly appreciated. Well, we are grateful for your participation. Franklin Templeton Alternatives is the title sponsor for this season of Capital Decanted. And we are grateful for Franklin Templeton's longstanding devotion to client first mentality, to ensuring that clients build diversified portfolios. So this was a really great match and partnership for our first season. Dave, maybe a couple of questions for you, because I think a lot of listeners might be unfamiliar with the sheer scale and scope and activity, M&A activity of Franklin Templeton over the last several years. Tell us a little bit about just level set for us, the alternatives, offerings and scale at Franklin Templeton. Absolutely, John. So alternatives are just a natural extension of what you described earlier as a client first mentality. For 75 plus years, we've been focused on helping clients solve problems in the investment landscape. This is a part of that. But you're right. A lot of folks aren't aware of our size and scale today. Alternatives by Franklin Templeton 
is now approximately $260 billion in assets, making us a top 10 player in alternatives globally. And we cover all the major food groups from private real estate, private credit, private equity, and hedge funds. I think we do it in a unique way, focusing on acquiring best in class and differentiated institutional alternative managers, leaving them 100% alone from an investment perspective, and then bundling the resources of Franklin Templeton around them to help bring their business to the private wealth space. We're really excited about that. Fantastic. And maybe as we think about Franklin Templeton's history, I think most people would come to mind would be a very reputable and a longstanding history around public equity, mutual funds, international investing, particularly the Templeton portion of the brand. When was this moment of realization that you needed to diversify? And how has the organization gone about building out this stable of offerings you've referred to? I go back to our CEO, Jenny Johnson, who I know you know. And Jenny's always thought long-term about this business. Franklin Templeton, if we flash back in time, invented the mutual fund in many ways, shape, and form to help democratize access to public markets for individuals. And we're doing that here. So about five years ago, we took an approach that said, traditional investments will be a key part of our business going forward, period. But there's this growing landscape of alternatives where technology, operations, and regulatory structure are making them more accessible for the individual. And we want to participate in that. So while a lot of traditional firms have dipped their toe into the pool of alternatives, we've really tried to take a cannonball into the deep end. We've done four key acquisitions over the last five years that have scaled our business to the $260 billion we're at today. And what's really important to us, John, is three things. One, I mentioned this earlier, best in class and differentiated institutional alternative asset managers. Every firm that we own in the space sourced 98 plus percent of their capital from the largest institutions globally. We don't want to change that. What we want to do is maintaining their investment integrity, find ways to package and bring those products to the wealth space. And we've dove in the deep end there by building a 40 person end to end distribution team in the US focused on private markets and hedge funds to complement the work we do on the traditional side as a trusted brand to advisors. And the benefit we're seeing in conjunction and partnerships with firms like Kaya is really that trusted voice that we've built over decades is allowing us to help educate the next set of advisors to adopt alternatives on how to do so responsibly and appropriately for their client portfolios. Outstanding. And I think listeners, you hear that devotion to client first threaded through all of Dave's answers, which we really appreciate. Obviously, you don't want to give away trade secrets or maybe bring out the crystal ball. But as you mentioned, several food groups that you guys have been active in building out, as I said earlier, this stable of offerings. Are there gaps or particular aspirations that you think we might expect to see whether build versus buy Franklin Templeton continue to grow their business in? Yeah, John. So if I think about gaps first. Our gaps are in the real assets and the infrastructure space. We have a great real estate business through Clarion Partners, but we don't do real assets or infrastructure today. The other big notable gap is on the private equity side where we do growth and venture, where we do secondaries through Lexington Partners, but we don't have an LBO buyout business. I'd say our aspirations between those two gaps really do lie with the infrastructure space. And our CEO, Jenny, has been public about that. You have to do it with the right firm at the right price and the right time. But infrastructure is a future focus for us. And I would tell you, John, our overarching focus today is on execution. We've acquired the right managers. We've left them in place to do what they do best, which is manage capital. We've built our team. And now we're laser focused on being the right partner and friend to the distribution teams we've worked with for decades on the traditional side. Outstanding. Really good flyover of what you guys are doing. And it is very dynamic. There is kinetic energy to what you're building. The enthusiasm really just comes through each time I talk to a portion of your organization. So on behalf of the entire Kaya community and all of our listeners, thank you again for your support and partnership for this podcast. And listeners, stay tuned. We're going to move on to our segment where we invite our guests in. Thanks again. Well, welcome back to this episode of Capital Decanted. We are now, as promised, joined in studio by Joan Solitar, Global Head of Wealth Solutions for Blackstone, Fran Kennery, Head of Vanguard Investment Advisory Research Center. Welcome to Capital Decanted to both of you. Thanks, John. Thank you. 
Well, I think as Christy and I talked about this, one of the commitments we made to listeners, hopefully there will be some listeners, but one of the commitments we made to those prospective listeners that we wanted to tackle subjects that were sometimes divisive, confusing, complex, deep, and this was near the top of the list. I described it earlier as a beast, a leviathan to wrestle to the ground. And as you think about the title of this particular episode, democratization, which is somewhat synonymous with vanguards and even Jack Bogle's history, and alternatives, which is synonymous maybe more with any other with Blackstone. So it was obvious that you two were the perfect guests, and you two have been big supporters of Kaya, what we're trying to do with our wealth management ecosystem named Unify. So first of all, just thank you for being willing to be a part of this. I couldn't think of two more perfect guests to help us think through this. So let us get started. You have sat listeners through a long history and winding history of how we got here today. And now we get back to our moral financial question of how much intervention, what are the appropriate gates? What is the why and the how of executing on access to alternatives from ultra high net worth down through retail? So I'm going to start with Fran over at Vanguard. You've described yourself, Fran, through your long successful history at Vanguard of being kind of the serial entrepreneur. When they need someone to stand something up, create something new, innovate, you seem to be the guy they go after. And one of those was this private equity solution of a few years ago. But you've described how before that, the reason you were perhaps the guy they tapped is that you had done significant research on the long-term illiquidity premium. And the client benefits, and maybe this is behavioral, maybe this is financial, of adding private capital in portfolio. So maybe I thought we'd zoom out to start and just, Fran, walk us through the numbers and your outlook, where the allocation would come from in the typical advisor portfolio from your perspective, and the general philosophy on glide path over the course of a life from early stage accumulation through decumulation near retirement. Thanks for the kind words, John. Vanguard has been on the front foot of trying to democratize investments for investors. Investing can be complicated and sometimes it can be reserved for the largest pools of capital. And through our history, we've been trying to take investment solutions down market. Mass retail can benefit from some of the same things that pension plans, endowments, and foundations have done. To your specific question, we do see that If we go to that cohort or that demographic of investor, a retail investor, one could argue they have too much liquidity, right? They're 100% liquid and 100% liquid assets. And they actually don't have a withdrawal program or need. Let's take a 25, 30-year-old saving for retirement. They actually know when the liability is going to come due, when they're going to retire and when they're going to have to actually start making draws on the capital. So that would be a perfect solution should there be an illiquidity premium. We know that there's an illiquidity premium on all asset classes. So this is not uh, private markets, right? You can look at on the run, off the run treasuries. You can look at different tranches of individual bonds of the same company that trade. So it's really a supply demand. And so there's an illiquidity premium in all asset classes. And in private investments, that illiquidity premium can be pretty steep. So for an investor who does not need 100% liquidity, foregoing 100% liquidity and taking some illiquidity premium, even if there's not alpha or manager selection, we think would be a good thing. As to your point of the glide path and how that would all work is we have target retirement funds or when we advise people directly, we change their asset allocation as they near decumulation, meaning when they would start to need capital and to spend that down. So you could start off with a investor that has a 20, 30, 40 year horizon that would have private investments as a part of their public investments, some ratio that would be there, let's say 10, 20, 30 percent, depending on many other specifics. And you could just decay out of those, right? You could you go back into 10 years prior to withdrawal, 15 years prior to withdrawal, and start just not to reinvest those assets. So when you hit that landing spot of decumulation, you would end up at zero. Interesting. So we talked in the first segment about some of the challenges and risks individuals who are pursuing investments in some of these complex strategies and wrappers. What circumstances would cause you actually to not recommend a private capital allocation to somebody? Yeah, that's right, Christy. I mean, as with many things, the devil's always in the details. 
Everything I just said is predicated on a lot of secondary conditions. Certainly an investor who is in withdrawal, right? It still amazes me a little bit that the endowment and foundations are some of the most heavily allocated to illiquid investments, yet they have a 5% capital call every year. And we saw what happened in 2008 in the global financial crisis as to how that happened. Our thought on this is really understanding how much liquidity or illiquidity the investor can bear, whether they be a retail investor, a pension, or an endowment, and making sure that you don't get caught in a rebalancing trap, as we saw in the global financial crisis, because these assets will not mark where public assets mark. And so we saw a real uncomfortable position. Think about it if you're 70, 30 equity fixed income or 80, 20, and half of the book is private, non mark to market assets, while your mark to market assets all reprice. And if they reprice 30, 40, 50% down, you are forced to either let your private investments drift beyond your policy allocation or come to some other area. So you really have to be careful that you have rebalancing bands and that you are comfortable with a contagion situation. Certainly that denominator effect is real. Joan, do you have any thoughts on that? Just a couple of things. Private assets actually are marked and there's quite a process around that, as you can imagine, with investors coming inside and outside of the fund. The difference is that they are not subject to the whims of the market. Whereas, for example, private REITs have had movements 20% more volatility like a dozen times over the last 10 years. It's not actually what we see in the real world of real estate investing. So just want to distinguish that they are actually marked. And one of the benefits and that institutions find over decades is that they're higher returning and less volatile. And in exchange for that, you give up liquidity. And so for individuals, the key, whether they're in their later years or not, is to figure out of my pool of assets, what percent do I not need to access in a day? That's really your decision. That's well said. And I think behaviorally, which we'll get to, there's a big part of this, right? That I think has been conditioned to need access to 100% liquidity, right? So we'll get back to that in a moment. Fran, one more opening question. We talked a little bit about, again, in the opening segment about the whole challenge of due diligence, of manager selection, of the power law that is deep and broadly understood in private equity throughout the stratifications from buyout down through venture. I think if you listen to the general media, you'd think that you would have to be the equivalent of LeBron James and choosing managers to beat the S&P. And Fran, you've helped me over the years that while this is certainly not easy, the math isn't maybe as unreachable as you might think. Could you just walk us through the quartiles and how you should think about your skill set that is required to be effective at choosing high quality private equity managers? Yeah, I think the LeBron James analogy is a good one, right? So you don't have to be in the 1% or the 5% or even the 10%. When you see the dispersion, and just for the audience, if you were to take managers and quintile them or quartile them, you would see that even if you were able to get a manager without perfect foresight, just throwing a dart and getting a manager in the bottom, the first, second, third, and fourth quartile, you would still come out with positive excess returns because of the way the dispersion works around the median. And so... What that entails is it's manager selection and due diligence is critical. Let's be clear, because you could easily have an oversampling into the fourth quartile, which the worst quartile, which would not work out well. Uh, but you do not have to have a significant oversampling in quartile one of managers. Just the way the asymmetry is around the median or the asymmetry is around the average, if you are just able to be average given the asymmetry, it should work out well for the end investor, obviously, depending on the terms, the fees and everything else that's there. And I think it goes without saying, perhaps as a compliment to what you've just said is diversification around the managers you choose is important because the probability just mathematically of choosing the one that's in the top one or two quartiles is one thing. If you choose four or five, 
you're likely to have that dispersion in a way that takes advantage of that asymmetry. So thank you to that, Fran. Christy, back to you. I'd actually like to jump back to the discussion of liquidity. So certainly a challenge, definitely real in our world. It seems as though at least it's due to conditioning. So what the investor expects versus what the offering actually entails. Could you actually walk us through the B-Read experience and what lessons were there and what was learned and how to communicate and educate on liquidity in particular? And just to level set so folks know, this is Blackstone's private real estate funds that's offered to individuals. And we set it up with a mechanism to provide 5% liquidity overall fund or to cap it at 5% per quarter, 20% per year, so that you don't have a mismatch. Because buying a company or buying a building is not like daily trading stocks or bonds, and you never want to be in a position where you're forced to sell assets to meet liquidity demand. We spent a lot of time up front educating advisors on how the fund works. And I think you also need to start with why are institutions and individuals investing in private markets? And relative to what we said earlier, right? Historically, private investments, they've been less volatile. They've provided higher returns than their public market counterparts over time. And in exchange for that, you're giving up some liquidity. So we created the fund to own less liquid assets, real estate. And as I said, did not want to be forced to sell at inopportune times which can happen in mutual fund structures if they're owning a lot of illiquids as well. Fortunately, this is a fund that is exceptionally well curated, very high quality real estate in the top sectors that we like. Namely, we own multifamily housing, student housing, logistics, data centers, and largely avoids the sectors that we don't like, which is traditional U.S. office. So during this period, we've been able to continue to deliver good returns to investors. That's both yield and appreciation. And so I'd say while the press was wringing its hands around Blackstone adhering to the liquidity caps, we had very little noise. I actually don't know of any client complaints. And most inquiries were around what folks were reading in the press. So we've continued to see redemptions decline month by month, and the press noise has died down. You asked about what are some of the lessons. And I think we educated advisors well at the outset. But during this period, we leaned in even more. We were out front and center with clients. And so I think the roadmap is pretty simple that you have to be transparent, you have to be present, and you have to lean in when there's any kind of disruption or noise. So I think coming through this, we actually received great kudos for over-communicating. And I think we were able to strengthen our relationships. Speaking of blueprint, Joan, and maybe just to build upon that, you've talked, and by the way, both of you to some degree have been founders within a large organization, right? Because you stood up this capability to a large degree too, just as Fran has. But you've talked about this importance of a holistic solution, not just launching a product and pushing it down through the wirehouses, but from product development to education, I'll put, as you might imagine, from Kaya's perspective, a specific emphasis there on education, analytics, investor services. And then the global footprint, the reach. Why was it so important for Blackstone if they were going to dip their toe into the democratization world to have this full stack of service? I think it's a great question. And it's really because what we provided was not just access to Blackstone's institutional quality investments or some innovative product structure, but really what we did was create a better experience for advisors and investors to be able to access private markets. And 
it's that entire ecosystem. And you could come up with analogies in other areas. So if you think about Apple, for example, yes, Apple came out with excellent product, but it was also the innovation around user education, top client service that created the experience or Starbucks. Is it really that they came up with a better coffee blend or is it the experience? And so what we really wanted to do was create this seamless journey for our advisors and our customers. And so we run our business end to end, everything from the product structuring to marketing and education to meeting with advisors and then to a very robust investor services team. And we do this everywhere around the world. And when we are in France, we're speaking in French with French materials, French websites. You need to be where the customer is. You need to be very local, even if you're a U.S. institution. So I think that was really our innovation. And we have just continued to augment that with more education and access to more of our platforms and just greater presence in more places around the world. I want to ask too, the beauty of private markets, as you stated, is that you really aren't forced to invest in the whole market, but you can choose what neighborhood you want exposure to. So how has that philosophy played out in your decision and your rollout beyond what you've already discussed? Sure. Yeah, I think that's really important. You can't be all things to all people, or at least you can't do everything well. And so what we have set out to do is provide solutions in the areas where Blackstone has demonstrated real excellence over a long period of time, and whether that's private real estate or private credit or private equity and the like. And Every advisor and every investor has different needs, right? As I mentioned, we're not just out there selling a product. I think the key is really listening to what an individual advisor needs. And then our goal is to provide a solution to that need. And I believe that our funds sit very nicely next to whether it's stocks, bonds, money markets, and the like. We're not trying to suggest that we should be part of the whole solution, but rather that we can provide a solution in these particular areas. Fran, maybe turning back to you and kind of comparing what you guys have done so far, you've taken a different at least distribution route. I mean, part of that is the real nature of Vanguard's corporate ethos versus a Blackstone, right? So you're not creating product that then partnering with wirehouses to distribute to advisors. You've got these advisors on staff. And I think, as I understand it, that you've created this diversified vehicle in partnership with Harborvest to include diversification across stage, vintage, geography in a traditional fund structure. And I think I mentioned to you, we spent some time in the first segment on the different fund structures, truly liquid registered, partially liquid, a BREIT type of situation that has liquidity gates, And then, of course, traditional drawdown funds that is only available to QP. I think yours sits in that ladder. But help us walk through why you chose that route for the qualified folks first. I would agree with everything Joan said as it relates to being all things to all people. I think where Vanguard's history, we are probably world-class specialist in equity index, public equity index, public fixed income index. But we're also one of the largest and most successful active fixed income managers, both on the taxable side and the tax exempt side. When it comes to active public equity, we've tended to outsource that for our whole history. Firms like Wellington, Prime Cap, where we actually go find best in class managers. So when we decided to enter private equity, we obviously wanted to hire what we felt was the best in class. What we do in our portfolio review group is we take an asset class, let's say it's large cap growth or small cap value, or in this case, private equity. We get thousands and thousands of the best wanting to potentially have a relationship with us. And then we start the process of selecting the manager. So we decided to go with Harborvest there. We also, within our history, we believe in the total market, right? So we have total stock market, total bond market as our core to the portfolio. So 
We wanted to give exposure across the ecosystem of private equity investments. We chose the latter structure. There was some comment we were talking earlier about illiquidity versus liquidity and mark to market versus not. We felt that we are in an illiquid fund. Put it this way, it doesn't mark to trade, right? So there can be certain things that are marked to market, but they're certainly not marked to trade, right? When you are listed public, let's take the read example. We have one of the largest public read funds. It's priced to trade. And you'll see a huge delta between a private real estate and a public real estate. Same thing in private equity. So when we saw last year, 2022, small caps and equities in general priced down 25%. We didn't see that at all in private equity because it just was not marked to price, let's put it that way. We felt also that you had mentioned earlier, John, about some behavioral benefits. And I actually think we know clients are emotional and it's understandable, right? If you lose 20 or 30% of your wealth in an asset A, it gets hard to stomach that type of volatility. And so the fact that these do not price to trade or mark to market I've always said if we were to mark the total stock market fund once a year with stale, not mark the trade prices, investors would actually, the behavioral gap that's out there that we do at Vanguard and Morningstar does with the behavioral gap would probably shrink pretty dramatically. But we do price liquid funds every day in what I would call mark to trade, meaning you can sell it 100% if you want. We decided that most of the value creation and the managers that were out there were in the qualified program, in the less liquid program. And we actually wanted to cover and capture that illiquidity premium. So that's been a couple years now. And I know there was hints in the press release and in some of your discussions about experimenting QP only. That was in some sense the easiest because it's the structure, the drawdown fund that is most pure, right? As you've described, those are my words, not yours. But as you've thought about moving down that wealth channel, into where Blackstone is operating, the accredited space. And yet some of the constraints that would have to be introduced, whether it's liquidity gates or number of investors or leverage, et cetera, how do you think about those decision trees? Are you moving that direction or are you content in the QP only? We're never content. We want to continue to democratize what I would say investment solutions that we have high conviction in adding value to clients. But it's not as easy... There's some regulatory issues, and the regulatory issues are pretty real. We want to make sure that by the structure does matter, and we want to make sure that the structure preserves the best chance of investment success for the end client or the advisor who's using that. So we will continue to do everything we can to make sure that we preserve the investment case and making sure that the structure that we decide to go with does not dilute that investment case in any way. Speaking of investor success, back when I was committing capital on behalf of qualified purchasers, if you will, one of the potential risks that perennially comes up is that these traditional drawdown funds will get the best investment talent. Along with that, the best deals, the best underlying portfolio companies, and then ultimately apply the best process and sell at the highest mark. And then everybody else gets the leftovers. That's the kind of narrative that I think sometimes happens. So institutions get the best of the best and everybody else gets the leftovers or the people who might have washed out. So how do we as an industry protect against individual investors getting the B team? What are your thoughts on the A team versus the B team distribution when it comes to that historical narrative within the space? This is an essential question. When asked in rank order, what's most essential to you as an advisor choosing a manager? Of course, investment performance is key and trust comes up. So I think there's always cynicism around what's going to an individual versus an institution. And because of that, I think we were very focused on turning that completely on its head. So we use the same team. There is no B team, actually. And when it comes to the drawdown funds, which only the qualified purchasers can access, it's exactly the same fund. We don't have a different fund. It's the same fund that institutions are investing in. So in that case, we're providing institutional investments at institutional pricing. And I think one of the innovations when we launched the open-ended funds was to actually reduce the pricing rather significantly 
relative to what was out there. So when we're creating a fund, it's always with what is the net return to the investor over time. So for a fund like BREIT, over now close to seven years, we've been able to generate 12% net return. And we did that by using the A-team, we're the biggest commercial real estate investors in the world, choosing the best sectors, and then pricing the fund well so that you can generate a good return without having to go out on an extended risk curve. I think that you have to look under the hood. I think you have to be discerning about which firm is managing your assets. I do think, as I mentioned, on average, private investments have yielded greater return, but there's still a wide dispersion between top managers and the lower tier. And so I think not all managers are the same. I think you have to do your homework and go through an investment advisor. So that is what we are doing. We're working with investment advisors all around the world. And I think they and their firms can choose which are the firms that the biggest institutions are allocating to in these particular asset classes. Do they have a demonstrated track record in those particular asset classes through cycles? And ultimately, the proof is in the pudding. We talked about mark, and I just, I can't emphasize this enough. These are marked. They're not marked daily because we're not selling them daily. But if you look over 38 years, it's incredibly rare that we would have sold an asset below the mark, which suggests we're marking appropriately. And unlike stocks, you have to mark daily because people are coming in and out of the fund every day. But that's not the case in these funds. And so whether they're monthly or quarterly, there's actually quite a rigorous protocol around that. But what we don't have are the whims of the market where all of a sudden liquidity freezes up and a particular stock go down 50% in a single day. And the denominator effect, again, just to be clear, during the financial crisis, I don't think foundations and endowments were left without the ability to meet their 5%. But if the suggestion is that because stocks and bonds went down so much that they should have had more of them because they were liquid, I'm, I'm not sure any of those institutions would say that's the right answer. And in fact, if you look at the best performing endowments and foundations, consistently, they're the firms or the institutions that have allocated the most to private investments over time. Again, going back to the basic question, why should individuals not be able to access the excess return of the highest performing foundations and endowments? In our grandparents' time, many more people had access to pensions, which do invest a lot in illiquids, but that's not the case today, right? Today, it's really left up to the individual. And so today you have more access. I think you have better product out there. You have better technology, which is enabling a lot of this growth but it's still quite early days. So less than 5% on average are allocated to these private funds. And so I think you protect like you do any other investment. So it's who's investing your money at the end of the day and what are those returns over time? I want to jump to you, Fran, in just a second on one of the statements that I think was profound that Jones said, I mean, you said a couple things there that I think are really important. First is there's no easy button for beta access here, right? Manager selection is important. We've touched on the dispersion here. So you have to be careful. You got to be equipped. You got to have a fiduciary in the room. I think we would all agree on that. And Fran, maybe that leads me to my next question to you. You've been very vocal on this. And I know Vanguard has been very active in working with the SEC, the DOL, and some of the other agencies that have a voice, a seat at the table in perhaps liberalizing or evolving the accredited investor rule. So much of that, as we've talked about, was anchored in response to exploitation of clients, whether that was back in the roaring 20s or the craziness of pre-GFC, right? History rhymes, as we said earlier. What are your thoughts on, besides the binary wealth and income rule that really is 
come to define yes or no, what other elements should be in place for someone to have access to these types of instruments? Wealth and income, and the regulators are in a tough spot, right? Because they want to protect, and they do a really good job protecting investors. We should first take a step back and commend them. The spirit of what they're trying to do is the right spirit. And if you have wealth and income, the idea behind that is you could afford to lose that wealth and income. The risks or the consequences to that entity or household is a lot different than a mass retail client, right? But one could argue that if it is advised, so if there is a fiduciary in the mix and the fiduciary is the decision maker in that, and that fiduciary also is knowledgeable of when liquidity is needed or not needed. And again, such as when you are either advised directly or through one of these single fund solutions, you have an end date, a 2060 fund. You know exactly how the investor and when the investor is going to, and then hold the fiduciary responsible, right? So hold the manager or the advisor responsible for the allocation to illiquid assets, I think is something that we have commented with them over time. But again, back to the last question, I do want to make sure we cover that because I do think manager selection is critical. Uh, it's obviously critical. When we're talking to the managers, they only have a certain amount of supply, right? They do close. And so we do see when we study the Nakubo database, for those who are not familiar with it, it's just ranking the endowments and foundations by size, jumbo, large, mid and small. You see a tremendous difference in performance both of the total portfolio and private investments. And so there is an access advantage, not for all managers, right? Maybe there's not an A or B team at all places, but all of the managers that we talk to have been closed for many years. So it's not even just your size. It's when did you first hire that manager? And then you're going to get the first opportunity to re-up with that manager if there's supply. So we definitely see a selection bias to Christie's question, and a pretty significant selection bias where the largest and the earliest do get access. And it comes out when you study different pension plans and endowments and foundations by size. So I guess from Blackstone or anybody's perspective, how do you think about that reputation, fighting it appropriately? Because what you just said a few things that I think highlight the fiduciary dedication that you have. And yet that's not what Main Street often is fed in the narrative. So how do we fight this PR problem that we've got as an industry? I think you put it right, which is that it's a PR problem. It doesn't seem to have affected the demand for private investments. And I think the industry has to continue to educate all of the different constituents, whether it's, of course, the investors, but also government, regulators, and press. And the industry needs to continue to carry itself at the highest level. But as I mentioned, the proof is in the pudding. So how have these companies and real estate performed over time versus publicly traded? And even in the most extreme cases, going back to the global financial crisis, not a lot of bankruptcies, not a lot of private credit defaulted. I heard today that there's never been a high-grade CLO default ever. I think we have to separate fact from fiction. And no one likes to read negative headlines, but some of what you're talking about, like the Stop Wall Street looting, is put out there for a particular audience and a desired effect. I think when it's problematic is when that actually translates into regulation that ultimately harms customers. So think about this. I was thinking about this today. We, not that long ago, experience a mini crisis, if you will, where banks couldn't meet their depositors' demand for those deposits, what we think of as the safest, most liquid, and banks lend against those, right? So think about the concerns around, in the press and the government around private credit, they call it shadow banking, there's nothing shadowy about it. But these are finite structures 
where you actually match the liquidity to the lending. That's why you restrict the liquidity, where you're not reliant on investor deposits. These are investments being made. So I think we have to really unpack reality and hyperbole. I think that's really fair. Fran, just given how you have a more vertically integrated structure than Blackstone's, can you tell us about the conversation to get off of zero and what directions do these conversations typically go? The original conversations of off to zero run a pretty wide spectrum. Some of our investors have wanted Vanguard to come forward with this type of offer and may have private investments already outside of Vanguard. And so you can imagine those conversations being a lot more easier than a client that potentially does not even, I think Joan mentioned earlier, there's a big opportunity to educate and also to have a more positive PR because in the end, most of the structures have benefited client outcomes. You would think having a more positive narrative, there's obvious risks to any investments, including as we just heard through just your banking account. So there's really no true risk-free asset. And the question is, do we have the proper solution, the proper managers, the proper structure to that? And then do we have the right allocation, right? Because all of those are going to end up mattering. What you really want is the education up front and education, not just on the positive sides of what private investments can do, but also on the downside of when things don't go well, this is how they could be performed. Because the best investment outcome is that the client has gone through all of the scenarios and is well-educated. And if the client does stay the course with the private investments, we're pretty confident that it will add value over the long run. Joan, I'm going to ask you to have our last word with a little bit of crystal balling, right? You mentioned this is early days. There's no doubt about it, right? This kind of started as feeder funds in the wirehouse. We've got product proliferation happening, starting with you guys. Even Vanguard is creating QP capabilities. You've had aggregators like iCapital and Case pop up to maybe make this glide path a little bit more easy for those smaller RIAs. I know you've been involved as an investor with iCapital, for example. As you look out, these numbers are enormous. We started out in the earlier part of the podcast with a 1% change. If we go from 3 or 4%, whatever our best estimate is on allocation of the typical individual investor, if they go just 1% more, you're talking possibly a trillion dollars shifting from 60-40. It is a massive transition. What segments do you think are most best positioned to capture that? Do we continue to utilize these aggregators? Do you think Blackstone vertically integrating or someone like you integrating a little bit more? How do you think this plays out given just the sheer scale of capital windfall moving in this direction of private markets? It's a great question. I wish I had that crystal ball, which I don't. Of course, we all do. But I could tell you from traveling around the world, why do people invest? They invest because they want cash in their pockets and they want to be able to accumulate value over time, the value of compounding. And so I don't think there's a one size fits all. I really think it's the array of options that we talked about, whether it's yield orienting or appreciation generating. And I do think those will increasingly find their ways into portfolios and why and how. And they will, one, because there's just better access today than there was, but still, even in the US, which is the furthest along, probably 80% of advisors have never put private investments into their clients' funds. That's changing, but it'll take a long time to get there. You touched on technology. The day that you can invest as seamlessly as you can buy a stock or a bond, that's a game changer. And we are definitely not there. Even the tools around portfolio construction, I don't think are as sophisticated as they will be one, three, and five years from now. We're still talking about e-signature and it's 2023. I think there will be advances. You always think they'll come faster and then all of a sudden they're here. So I don't have asset targets. I can just see that this is a secular trend that is continuing up. It will have cyclical bumps like everything else. Uh, But I think we will be many multiples of where we are today. And for me, success, I think about our own business today. We're managing more than 
240 billion for private wealth customers. It's about a quarter of Blackstone's trillion dollars. And if we can continue to provide excellent product and match that with excellent service, and our clients have great outcomes, that to me is success. And I don't know what that number is, but that's really how I think about it. Well, as Samuel L. Jackson said in Jurassic Park, hold on to your butts, right? It's going to be a wild ride. We don't know exactly how we'll get there. Hopefully there's no dinosaurs involved, but there will be lots of room for innovation and lots of growth opportunity for even leaders like Vanguard and Blackstone. So listen, Joan and Fran, it is always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us on this episode of Capital Decanted. And listeners, stay tuned for the last sip. Thank you for hosting. Always great. Yes, thank you very much, John and Christy. Thank you. Well, welcome back to Capital Decanted and this episode where we are tackling democratization of alternatives. And it is time for us to close, Christy, with the last sip. That was really interesting. I think it further shaped my thoughts, validated some, maybe challenged other assumptions. But after kind of all this prep, are opening that conversation. Where are you on all of this? Are you still just processing? Have you come to closure intellectually? Where are your big takeaways? It's so hard because I think we mentioned earlier, it brought up emotions. I think on one hand, I understand the desire to regulate and to save people from themselves and the recognition that particularly when up against global firms, the individual investor is bringing a knife fight to a much heavier weaponed fight on the other side. There is an element of, I think that sometimes you don't even know the questions to ask or the way to perform due diligence. But then the other side of me does think this is not rocket science. When done well, it is in depth and it is difficult and it takes a lot of time. But again, there's nothing with investing in privates that cannot be learned, taught, understood, and utilized. And so the libertarian Texas piece of me feels like it's my God-given right to lose my own money. But I also recognize that's coming from, I have committed over the course of 15, 16 years, multiple billions in private and in alternative assets on behalf of other institutions and et cetera. I recognize that I come from maybe a different angle and maybe I'm not appreciating what the average investor really can commit to in terms of learning and keeping tabs of that. But I do want to make sure that we don't divorce the education of the investor from the actual investment. It doesn't sound like that's happening, but it's just something that I'm super mindful of. What about you? My thinking has evolved substantially because I think when we begun this episode or when we decided to begin this episode, I think, you know, even pre-prep, I was largely in the camp of, you know, that my very wiring suggests we need bold, objective commitment to education, right? Of course, first, full stop. But then letting most everyone get access to those alternative sources of cash flows, returns, and asset classes. Let the chips fall, the libertarian, right? But here's the thing. Perhaps where I risk making all the same conflation mistakes I warned about at the very beginning of the episode, especially in the US with the restriction of performance fees to just qualified folks and therefore higher management fees, and at least on registered funds, these constraints on leverage, daily pricing, it's just not clear to me we've solved the liquid 1.0 risk return failure. And I think we've made some progress. Some of these products that we talked about today, I think are maybe exceptions, but the wrappers and all the trappings that come with them really matter. And they perhaps rightly or wrongly influence my larger philosophy on the whole subject. So I do think, and it sounds like Joan is thinking about this really carefully. I think maybe more generally, the GPs are underestimating the cultural, the talent, particularly on the distribution and client service side to stand up this effort for this channel. It's just completely different target market, behavioral assumptions, conditioning, tax implications. So I think that inferior product risk is there, definitely. It's like a product fit that it's trying to fit a certain type of investment strategy into a wrapper that people are familiar with. And again, it's like that mismatch of having private assets and something that has quarterly liquidity. To your point, when you say inferior, I just wanted to call up. I assume that's what you meant, that just not as good of a product market fit. No, I didn't even mean that. I mean like the B team, A team debate is what I mean. I think we need to be really careful with that. I'm not sure we've solved that. I think Joan had a very good answer. Blackstone's taking a very careful and equitable approach, but I'm not sure that's the general pathway. If you ask me where I come out, the QP level, I think is pretty straightforward. You can pursue the real thing. True drawdown funds, world's best private capital talent, track record alignment with fee structure, 
I think the long-term value creation and portfolio benefits are clear. You should have a big allocation to this. And on the accredited side, I'm steadfast that this rule should be liberalized. I really believe that. And just as we showed the initial intention of the first SEC was to allow not just for wealth, but expertise. And by the way, I'm with Fran that should also require some type of fiduciary intermediary or partner or plan sponsor as well to help shepherd this. I think that there is plenty of room to allow more in if they're properly educated. But here's the big but as I close. The wrappers available to the accredited and retail space still have much to be desired. I mean, we've heard about some BDCs, interval funds, Blackstone's offering. The registered space is just very concerning to me. I will close with this. We didn't touch on the whole 401k DOL DC plan issue. But I think the least path of resistance is in 401k target date funds, because this is set it and forget it. This doesn't require a lot of the regulatory problems that others do, meaning you can stuff that portion of the pie if it's less than 15% and have it be registered and you can have the real thing as long as it's under the 15%. Folks aren't typically looking at that day to day, aren't drawing on liquidity, and it gives you real life, real high quality, at least philosophically, to private capital if these plan sponsors are doing their job. So I think that is the best path forward if you're at accredited or retail. So how's that for a hedged answer? I'm not sure where I am. I do think it's funny the way that we frame these because we could have just as easily said, why don't we bring back the defined benefit plan? Because you get other, besides just the performance, you get other benefits, you get scale, you get to dictate terms. So just getting access is not necessarily the same thing. But I found it funny that then it's just instead of saying, hey, why don't we bring back DB plans? It's, oh, why don't we let 401ks and DC go into private investments? It was like a funny thing. And I know that there are some people out there rolling their eyes and saying, we can't do that, but we could. Come on. It's really a fear of litigation. Back to my earlier point. I mean, there's nothing in ERISA that suggests, and the DOL made this clear, we didn't talk about this either, that there's nothing in ERISA that suggests you can't have private capital alternatives access in 401ks. It's just these plan sponsors don't want to touch it. And I don't blame them right now. Because the litigation is based off of fees, is so tied to fees. I get that. Yeah. Final fun question as we do each episode. The one that we've chosen this time is, Christy, what activity or hobby that you love do you think listeners might be surprised to find out that you love? I have before publicly stated that I love basically anything that a grandma would love. So imagine reading on a rainy day or doing puzzles with my daughter or gardening. The big one that everyone makes fun of me is knitting because I sometimes on Zoom calls, you can see me in the background as I'm listening, just knitting because doing something with my hands helps me focus. I do lots of grandma things, despite not yet being a grandma and it being quite a ways away from being a grandma, actually. And then beyond that, I love to sing and weirdly do karaoke. So shout out to Jeremy. Next time I'm in Chicago, we have to go do more karaoke. What's your go-to karaoke song? Okay, so when I was in Chicago last October, Jeremy told me that I should do All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey, and it hit so hard. You have no idea. So yeah, you can't do it in December. You can't do it in January. But once October hits, I think everyone's ready to hear the song. So that was a good one. And then Anything Journey. Anything Journey. That's the statement of the day. So just for listeners, Jeremy is Jeremy here of now University of Illinois. So hello, Jeremy. It's funny. I asked my kids, Christy, this question. They were like, Dad, you're kind of boring. There's nothing that will surprise them at all, which I think is kind of true. Honestly, like I could say fitness and sports and reading and travel, but what person in our industry doesn't love that stuff? So I'm in Utah now, as I think probably several people that listen know. So I could also say things like skiing, but that would be obvious. So here's where I'm going to go. For Father's Day, for Father's Day, I got my first road bike. And listen, I'm not great on a bicycle. I'm not bad on a bicycle, but I'm not great. But my wife is elite. And my oldest son is a beast with these long mountain rides. So I get this thing. My son and his wife come into town. They're like, Dad, we're going to do our first ride. And we're going to go on the other side of the Wasatch Mountains, which is the big range that has all the famous ski resorts you would all know if I told you. And we're going to ride over and down back to this side. So this is 18 mile, 19 mile climb, 22 mile downhill. Christy, it was the most exhausting, emotionally miserable four hours of my life. I don't know if that makes me a cycler or a poser or what, but yes, I'm all in. I'm not going back now. And John is incredibly patient with all things, as you can tell from that story. I'm not sure if you would have seen me about halfway up that hill, you would have thought the same. So that's really cool. I didn't know that. All right, listeners. Thank you for hanging in there. Episode two, 
in the books. We'll be back next time. This time, we did not have our guests spoil the next episode. So this is going to have to remain a suspense as it was intended to be. So thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Capital Decanting.